my my key verse today is in John, or I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 26, and it's verse 14 and 15 and 16. It, it gives you kind of a a background, if you will, as to why this encounter happened in the in the garden. And it says, then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. <clears throat> Thinking back to those three verses, it, that's what laid the groundwork, and that's what caused this encounter in the Garden of Gethsemane with, with Malchus and, and Simon Peter, as it was stated in, in, uh, in John chapter 18. And, and to understand why this took place and why that meeting happened between them and, and what exactly they were doing at that point in time. So I, I've entitled this message, What Are You Searching For? And there's three key points that I want to cover today. There's three uh, key elements that as I was doing my studying um, that, that I ran across that I found to be very interesting. First of all, obviously we know that Judas was one of the disciples, and he portrayed Jesus with a kiss. You know, it, one of, somebody that he spent a lot of time with, somebody that he got very close to. You know, we've all heard the saying, you keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And I kind of think that maybe that was Judas' mindset. He thought, well, you know, if I just, you know, latch on and I just stay this close, I can receive all the benefits, but yet I still don't maybe have to do necessarily all the work. And I think sometimes... Christians' views are that way, that, that they think, well, you know, once I become saved, well, then I don't really have to do anything. I'll just, you know, be in God's good graces, and, and uh, you know, I'll receive all the benefits from that. And I kind of think that maybe this was Jesus' mindset and thinking, well, I'm just along for the ride now until it becomes an opportunity for me to become profitable. Until there's an opportunity for me to, say, you know, step out and, and to, uh, you know, make this a business business venture for me. And we see that in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14. When he went to the chiefs and priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him? What will you give me? What, what is this worth to you for me to deliver this guy to you? What is it worth? And he was paid 30 pieces of silver. He's going to betray a friend, someone that he trusted, someone that he grew close to, for 30 pieces of silver. He wasn't searching for anything that he could find in Christ. He wasn't searching to, to have his life transformed and changed. That's right. No. He was searching for what he could get out of it. Mm -hmm. He wanted to see how this could capitalize and, and, and gain for him. He wanted to see, well, if I'm this close to Jesus and all these good things are happening, what, where's my piece of it? And he betrayed his friend. And it said, even, even in uh, the video, it said, when he walked up to him in the garden, he said, my friend. And then he gave him a kiss. I don't know about you, but how can somebody do that? If they, if they truly say that you're the, you know, that if you truly say that you're that person's friend, how can you walk up to them and give them a kiss and betray them like that? But yet it happens every day. There's a lot of people that say that, oh, I'm your friend, but they're only there because you're maybe financially stable. Or they're only there because, you know, growing up, you were the only person that had a car. So you're their ride, you're their transportation. Hey, buddy, I'm only latching on to you because you have a car. And once you don't have that car, then where are they at? Oh, they latch on to their other buddy that's got a car. You know, and it's, it's not a true friendship. They're only in it for what they can get out for themselves. There's a lot of people out there in the world like that. They're only in it for themselves. They're only in it to see what they can gain out of it. They're only in it to make themselves look better, to make themselves feel better about themselves. But even though Judas was paid this money and he had that opportunity, and obviously we see as we read further in, in uh, Matthew chapter 26 that he proceeded with that plan, what did Judas do with that all you know that that money that that little bit of money that he was given after a while he kept thinking about it and then in uh, um, uh, in actually 
chapter 27, it says, verse 3, it says, And when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. I think maybe in, in some regards, in retrospect to his actions, maybe he kind of acted in haste and, and he thought, you know what, maybe, you know, maybe he thought in his mind, hey, Jesus is going to fight back. He's going to defend himself. He's going to show people his power. Maybe he thought in his mind somehow that, that this would come about. And, you know, and he would fight back and he would maybe, you know, that maybe Judas would feel better about himself for betraying because he knew that, that Jesus could do anything that he wanted to because he had, he had God's power. He knew that, that you know, he, he's seen the miracles. He's seen, uh, you know, all the, all the things that have taken place. But yet, maybe in his mind he thought, well, you know, uh, you know he, he can do this. He can get out of this. He can, there's a way for him to do it. So maybe, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, when he says he changed his mind, so maybe he did still have maybe some kind of shred of, of decency left in him. That's just speculation. I don't know for sure, but maybe he, you know, he had a change of heart and he realized, wow, you know, he's not doing what I thought he was going to do. He's not fighting back. He's not defending himself. He's not, you know, throwing his guards to the side and just, you know, walking away from them. No, he's going innocently. Without a fight, you know, when when somebody's get, being picked on and they're being bullied, you know, there's usually only one person that's doing the picking and the bullying. The other person is just kind of standing back, to you know, not wanting, to, not wanting to fight back because they just want it to be done and over with. And if they do fight back, then it's even worse. So sometimes they they figure, well, if they just you know just stand there and do nothing, it'll be over soon. And I can't help but think that, that this was his mindset right there. And then he, he realized, the light bulb went off in his head while he realized that, wow, this guy really is innocent. This guy really is not, not guilty of, of what I just, you know, did to him. And he wasn't worth, I mean, he wasn't, you know, I shouldn't have betrayed him like that. He truly was a friend. He truly was there for me. But it was too late. He had already committed that act. And he had already been paid for that act. But yet, we see as we read in, in chapter 27, verse 3 and 4, saying, saying, I have sinned and betrayed, betraying innocent blood. Then he said, What is this to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. Judas felt, from what I'm understanding here, <clears throat> Here he felt guilty, as anyone should. If there's ever been a point in your life where you've kind of stabbed your back, your friend in the back, you might have felt guilty about it. You might have thought, well, he didn't really deserve that. And to really, when I got into that position or that, that place that I thought that it was going to be so great, <clears throat> it wasn't. That place that you long to be in and, and that maybe that part of your life that you wanted to try and excel in and grow in, and once you got there, you realize, well, this really isn't what I wanted. This really isn't, you know, and now you look back and there's that bridge burning behind you of that friend that you stepped on or the one that you, you know, you betrayed. And you look back and you, and you realize that it really wasn't worth it. It really wasn't worth it. But you can't go back and undo what you've done. None of us can. We can't go back into our past and say, you know what? I'm going to walk the straight and narrow. I'm going to go back and do things right. We don't have that option. We don't have that luxury. This isn't back to the future that we live in. We can't go back and change what our future will be by altering our past and one little incident that happened. Our past is in the past. We can't change that. The only thing that we can change is our future. Our future could be, you know, we could continue on and carry on and, and think that we're just going to do our future. and We're going to do and go where we want to go. Or we can give in to Christ completely and sell out to Him and have Him lead, guide, and direct and move us in ways and places that we couldn't even imagine. Amen. 
It's our choice. It's our choice. We have that opportunity to blaze new paths. You know, there's a lot of uh, teams that have been coming on uh, Thursday nights, and I'll tell you what, it is amazing to see what God is doing. Amen. It's amazing to see the roles that are stepping up into, the people that are willing to be vessels for Christ, and the ones that are willing to, to share. You know, this past Thursday, Luke did a fantastic job with this video series and was talking about how you share your faith, and then we're talking about afterwards, uh, me and Pastor uh, Daryl, excuse me, we're talking about the movie that we're going to see on Thursday and how those two went hand in hand. You know, in this movie, and I'm not going to spoil it because so, I've already seen it, but in this movie, this kid is challenged to, to defend his faith, to, to prove to the teacher that God's not dead. Seems like a simple task sometimes, but it's not. I mean, you can, you know, you can show people, but, you know, he, he, he always had a rebuttal. He always had a scientific answer of why God's dead or, or why, you know, this scientist said this or that. But Luke brought out the point that, and it says in the Bible, that you have to be ready to give an account as to why you have the hope that you have. The hope that we have, you know, in Christ. You know, why do we believe what we believe? If we can't defend that and tell somebody that, then what are we believing in? What are we doing as Christians? If we can't show others why we have hope or show others in our life that we do have some kind of hope, mm -hmm. then what are we doing? We're wasting our time coming to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever night that, that we have church. We'd be wasting our time if we can't sit there and tell somebody why we believe what we believe or why we have that hope or what we have hope in. A lot of people are searching for answers. They want to know why or, you know, what is my purpose here? But outside of God, we're not going to truly find our purpose. That's right. Outside of Christ in our life, we're not going to understand the magnitude of why we're here. Because we think in our infinite, infinite minds while we're outside of Christ's will, we think our, our goal is to make as much money as we can, have the biggest house that we can, drive the most expensive car that we can, and this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. You know, keep up with the Joneses. Oh, the new, newest cell phone comes out, oh, i got to go have it. That's not the case with Christ. You know, you think about Jesus when he was walking this earth, and, you know, he said that when he told the disciples, no, the cost, he said, the, the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. He had no home. He went here and there and stayed wherever. It was no, hey, I have my million dollar, million dollar mansion over here and I've got my sports car there. And No, it wasn't like that. He had, you know, he told him, he said, look, you need to count the cost. You need to know that I do not have a place that I call home. Mm -hmm. And so we see that, that Judas, you know, to this point, that's what he was searching for. Like what the what the world is searching for. He was searching for wealth and fame and, you know, notoriety. And, and, and everybody wants to be recognized for something. And it's sad that, that you know, Judas was recognized and, and remembered by his kiss. That's right. You know, maybe the, the time before when he, you know, did things with Christ, he, you know, people remembered him or whatever, but the most thing that he's, he's well known for is his kiss of betrayal. The kiss of death, if you would. But it was all part of God's plan. So he knew that there was going to be a man that was going to betray Jesus. It was going to get close enough to him to know that after, after dinner and after they had their meal, they would go into the garden and pray. You have to know intimate details about people like that because he could have been anywhere at that point in time. Jesus could have went over here... But Judas knew, and it said that Judas knew where he was going to be. Judas knew that it was common practice for them to end the night in, uh, you know, in the garden and praying and fellowshipping with one another. He knew that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have went straight to the garden. Had he not known it, I mean, they could have been searching all night for him. And one of the things that I found while I was studying it says that, you know, they searched for him in the middle of the night. And there's two things that, 
that I want to point out about that. One is that, obviously, the people that were searching for Jesus and the Roman guards and, and everything, they were searching for Jesus at night because they didn't want to incite a riot. Because if you, th if you think back before, just a couple days before that, is that, with, uh, you know, the, uh, the Jews were celebrating, you know, the Palm Sunday as it was. You know, they were singing Hosanna's to the King, and they were large crowds. You know, and if they thought that, you know, Jesus was going to be mistreated and arrested in the middle of the daytime, I mean, can you imagine the riot that would have taken place? You know, I, I think back and I look back in our history when, um, out in California when they had that riot. You know, it was in the middle of the day, and I could just imagine that had they arrested Jesus in the middle of the day, I kind of think that that type of riot would have broke out. They would have been like, whoa, what are you doing? Get, you know, he's, he's a good guy. And so they decided to avoid all that, to go in the middle of the night, to, to search for him. You know, they took lanterns and swords and everything. They were prepared just in case there would be something that, if there were more people than just the disciples out there. They were prepared. You know, um, in my study, it was saying that, that I... Um, uh, that a cohort consisted of anywhere from 600 to 1,000 soldiers. Any, at any time that, that uh, they would prepare for like these riots, where they would have anywhere from 600 to 1,000 people that would be there to be the, the riot police and contain the things that could happen. There's probably a little bit less that happened. We don't know the exact number. It just said there was a large group. But they were there to contain in the garden in case something should get out of hand. Okay, and, and so they were there to make sure that, you know, first of all, that they did it at night when there wouldn't be too many people out. Most of them would be asleep. Um, and so they did it so they wouldn't have to maybe take so many men with them. And so they did it and they had people that were ready just in case something should break out. They could contain it. The other thing I, that I found interesting is that it said that the Passover always followed a full moon. So honestly, they really didn't need lanterns and and the things that they brought while they're you know while they were looking for Jesus they really didn't need that but they still had it and uh, in the saying it um, in the study it said that it's kind of ironic that they were searching for the light of this world hmm. with lanterns and torches and things that that were man you know man-made things and they were searching for the light of the world and they found them in the garden and so we see that that with Judas, that, that he was the one that led him right to Jesus. And he said, friend, and he kissed him on the cheek. And that's when all this took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then the, the um, uh, I want to read, actually in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verses uh 36 and following, it talks about Jesus praying. It says, And Jesus went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See that the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us, let us be going. See, my, my betrayer is at hand. In verse 47, it says, While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd of swords and clubs, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of them, 
one of those who were there with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, this, that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left and fled. I think it's very interesting when we back up to verse 49. It says, And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him and said, In verse 50 it says, Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Even at that point in time, Jesus still considered him a friend, even though he knew exactly what was going to happen. Even though God knows that, that we turn our back on him, he still seeks after us, doesn't he? He still calls us his friend. He still loves us. So much so that it says that in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believeth. didn't say that everyone's going to believe. He said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He knew that the, when he sent his son to this world that there's going to be people that just flat out reject him. He knew there was going to be people that were going to die never believing the truth. He knew that. But yet he still did it. Can you imagine, as a parent, what that would be like? Can you imagine sending your son or your, or your daughter or your, your only child to take the place of someone that you know that's just going to spit in your face? For someone that's going to turn their back on you? For someone that's going to take your name and curse it in vain? For someone that's going to do what they feel like they want to do. If you sent your son or your only child to die for somebody, to take their place, knowing that these things are going to happen, could you do it? Would you do it? No. I probably wouldn't either. But that's the love that God has for us. That's the love that when we are at our worst and our ugliest, when no one else sees us the way that God sees us, that's when he reaches down and says, here, let me help you, let me show you. Let me show you how much I love you. That even when we don't even deserve it, he shows his love to us. That's right. And that's just an incomprehensible thing sometimes. You can't, I mean, how can you wrap your mind around the love that God has for us? I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. You know, I, I look at, you know, you turn the TV on or you, you see the news and you see all these things. You know, this shooting happened, that stabbing happened, this robbery happened. You think, how can a God love that person? How can, how can anybody love that person that, that killed this person? How can, that, how can they love that person? It's kind of almost impossible for us to understand in our mind. When we become saved, we understand a little bit, but I truly don't think that we do truly understand. It's something that, you know, that we as Christians struggle with sometimes, that of forgiveness. You know, we want to hold on to a grudge. We want to hold on to that, well, you know, they did me wrong, so, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep that back in the memory bank. And at the time... When I need to pull that back up, I'm going to pull that card and play. God wasn't like that. God isn't like, well, you know what? You, you know, you, you did this and this and this. And so, you know, this is what's going to happen. I mean, we will on Judgment Day. But until then, he's given us every opportunity. He's given us opportunity after opportunity to come to our senses and realize the truth and realize the errors in our way. To understand that... There's a God out there that loves us to understand that, that he sent his son to die for us. And it's our job as Christians to relay that message. It's our job as Christians to give them that opportunity. To help them to make that choice or not make that choice. That's, that's on them. I mean, we, we are the messengers. We are the vessels that Christ used through, you know, through our humanness that we can portray the love of Christ. You know, we have to live it out. Because if we're not living it out and, and people, you know, know that we're a Christian and we're not showing 
the attributes of a Christian, what makes them want to change in the first place? Nothing. Nothing makes them want to change. And so we, when we look back in the story and we see that, that uh, you know, that this this sermon, it wasn't even it wasn't even a, a, an official. It was a sermon to the high priest. And as I was reading um, in these notes, these sermon helps, it was saying about how he probably was. You know, it said he was a servant, but he might have been a slave. He might have been somebody that, you know, he kind of had to get up because, you know, the high priest didn't want to go or didn't feel like being bothered sometimes. And, and so he, he had people that were in charge of those events and in charge of his affairs when he couldn't be there present. And so I think this is one of those instances where, you know, the servant was sent instead of the high priest because, you know, it was right at the Passover, and I'm sure that, you know, he didn't want to be interrupted. He didn't want to go out in the middle of the night. I mean, how many of us want to wake up in the morning? Not me. <laughs> but we have to. We do. You know, I'd much rather wake up at noon, you know, but that doesn't happen. I don't have that luxury. I'm not a teenager anymore. I don't, I can't sleep in. I have responsibilities. But this is, in this instance, is that this Malchus, this servant, didn't have a choice in the matter. You know, in that, in that event that took place in the Garden of Eden, you know, because he was a servant of the high priest, he was probably the first one in line. Because he had the authority over everybody else that was there. He had the authority over all the soldiers and all the, the other people that were following behind him. So he was probably in the front line. And that's why when the sword was drew, it was swung at him first. Because he was in the front line. Now, I think when... When uh, the sword was drawn and it was swung, I think he kind of ducked because I don't think that the person intended just to cut the person's ear up. I don't think uh, I don't think that was the case. I think that that the sword was swung and he kind of ducked and, and kind of was trying to defend himself, and that's what when it caught his ear. But that's just purely my speculation. But that event changed his life. You know, he was part of the group that was searching for Jesus. He was part of a group that wanted to, to find this Messiah. And uh, so we look at the, the Roman soldiers were the next group that were seeking to find Jesus. In John chapter 18, verses 1 through, four, four, one through 14, um, it dives into it a little bit more. And this is where we, we actually get the servant's name. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Jesus, who betrayed him, also knew this place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said, Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for? The guards knew they were looking for Jesus. Judas knew exactly who they were looking for. But Jesus said, who are you looking for? He already knew. So why do you have to ask? Maybe he wanted to, you know, reaffirm in them that they, you know, they, they found the right person. It says, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to him, to them, I am he. He didn't say, well, he's over here. He didn't say, well, you know, he, no, he said, I am he. And he said it boldly. He wasn't afraid. He knew that this was going to happen. He said, I am he. This is me. I, I'm the one you're looking for. And I think they were kind of like, you know, drawn back a little bit and, and kind of was like, are you, you know, are you sure? And it says, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you see? And they said, Jesus and others. Jesus answered, I told, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. He's like, I told you I'm him. Don't you believe me? You know, don't you understand that, that I'm the one you're looking for? It says, this was to fill the word that he had spoken of. Those whom you gave me, I lost not one. And then in, in verse 10 it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put it. Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? 
So we see that that in the Gospel of John, that the servant na servant's name was actually mentioned. And I don't know why. Um, in the notes, it said that maybe, you know, the Gospel of John was written after these two had already been long gone. But it's not. It's not for sure. But you know. In John, that's when his name was mentioned. And I know sometimes, like even when you look in the book of Luke, about the same story, that's the only place where it says that Jesus healed the man's ear. Now, Luke's perspective is that he was a physician. So his perspective on things were probably more from a medical standpoint and more from a, a healing standpoint and understanding that, you know, that there was a situation and this is how it was taken care of. And I was just talking with Marie this morning, and I said, well, I, I was talking about Judas, and I said, well, do you ever think that, that, that Judas was, you know, a, um, you know a, a true believer? Or was he just along for the ride? And, and uh, we talked about that. And then also, too, I said about P, uh, Simon Peter, and I said that, um, you know, I, I said from my perspective it is, is that, you know, my thought when he was in the Garden of Eden and he reacted, you know, Peter did a lot of things on, on reaction. He got out of the boat when he saw Jesus. You know, he, he grabbed the sword and swung it when he was in the garden. And I, to me, if you, like, read the, the previous verses and, and some of the previous verses in the chapters, is that it's talking about, you know, um, when Jesus told Peter, you know, said that you're going to deny me three times. And he said, you know, he was saying about how... Uh, you know, all these, all these other ones want to know. I, you know, I will be with you even until the death. And then that's when Jesus said, well, you know, surely Peter, tonight before the rooster crows three times, you will deny that you even knew me. And Peter's like, well, I would never do that. And in my mind, as I was, you know, reading and studying, I, I got to thinking, I'm like, well, in the garden, when, when Peter reacted and he grabbed that sword and he cut off the man's ear, why did he do that? And I got to thinking, and I'm thinking, well, was it anger that, that, that drove him to do that? Did he have hurt feelings? Because not only did Jesus say that you would deny me three times, but when they went to the garden to pray, he said, Peter, why are you sleeping? You know, couldn't you stay awake just one hour to pray? So maybe somehow Peter felt like, well, this is my opportunity to prove to Jesus that I'll be with him even until the death. Because striking at anybody, um, you know, with a sword, I mean, you're, you're there, there for a fight. You're not there to say, well, you know, I just, I, I, I did it by accident. I grabbed that sword and it was just a reaction. No. Yeah, it may have been a reaction that he grabbed the sword, but when he had that sword in his hand, it wasn't just a reaction to swing it. He knew what he was doing. He knew that that could even mean death. And I think maybe in some way in his mind, he was trying to justify and show Jesus, look, I'm true to what I said. Or I want to try to prove to you that when I said that I will be with you even until death, maybe this was my way of doing it. Maybe this was my way in my, in my mind thinking that, okay, well, Jesus said, you know, that what I told him, you know, that I'd be with him to death, he said that that's not going to happen. He said that I was going to deny him three times. I told him it wasn't going to happen, you know. Then he, he uh, you know, kind of scolded me for falling asleep. So this is my opportunity. This is my shining moment to show Jesus exactly what I can do for him. And I think from my perspective and, you know, from what, you know, the way that I would interpret it as, as like, if, if that was me, is that, I'd probably do the same thing. I would react the same way because in some ways it would be, I wouldn't say challenging to me, but it would be kind of a slap in the face to me when, you know, I would say I would do something and then somebody says, well, no, you're not going to do that. And it, it's kind of, and that's just probably just my own thinking, but like I said, this is from my point of view, um, which is very different than my wife's. My wife said, well, you know, she said that, you know, that Peter was defending Jesus. Peter, you know, Peter was defending his friend. But my point of view is that Peter was trying to defend himself and to prove to Jesus that he was going to follow him even to the death, even if it meant that 
in that day in the garden that he would die. And so it's very interesting to see two different points of view on, on, the, same, on the same thing. And I think that's what the Word of God does for us. And, and I think to what that means to me is that, is that before we react on, say, you know, when we read something and it, and it, and it hits us, and it, and it hits us deep, how we react to that may be the way that Peter reacted. He might have got defensive and said, well, I'll show you. I'll prove to you that, that I am who I am. Or we could say, no. I'm going to defend my friend. Or I'm going to take this approach to it because this is the right thing. And it's just, it just, I don't know, it's very interesting to me that, that there are just two different points of view on that. And you never really think, I, I never really think of it that way because, you know, I only see it through my point of view. But when I talk to other people, they're like, well, did you think of it this from this angle? It's like, no. You know, um, one of the, uh, one of my favorite movies is Vantage Point. And uh, it talks about, um, or the whole thing's about an assassination that took place. But there's, there's different points of view that they're looking at it from. They're not just looking at it from, a, you know, from straight ahead and saying, okay, well, you know, the person was standing here and the shot came from over here and, and this, this, and that, and the other, and it could be this person, that person. No, they actually took the time to, to see each different point of view. To see, okay, well, maybe it came from here, but then, no, that doesn't seem right. And they take the time to do that. Well, that's the same in our readings. When we study and we get into God's Word, we have to see it from different points of view. And the point of view that we need to see it from is God's point of view. We can interpret it and try to understand it ourselves, but if we don't have God's point of view and we don't have His, His mindset in mind, it's not going to do us a whole lot of good. And so we see that that the crowd was searching for Jesus. We see that 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 this uh, gentleman Malchus, who was kind of caught up in the middle of everything, who might not have even wanted to be there. I mean, it was like I said, it was during the Passover. It was a time of of feasting and a time of fellowship with friends and and your family and things like that. And so he was kind of getting pulled out from that because the high priest didn't want to be pulled out from that and go and do what the guy's job is. So he sent an ambassador. And, and so this event in the garden <laughs> changed this man because, you know, like it was said in the video, is that, you know, this is, uh, from my understanding, this is the last recorded miracle while Jesus was on the earth. You know, he, re he reached down and he touched the man's ear and healed him. You know, in Luke, in, in Luke, that's the only recording that it says that he healed the man. And can you imagine, and I think about this too, is that when, when we have an encounter with Christ like that, when we have an encounter that is true and genuine in our life, we're never the same. So can you imagine how this gentleman felt after Jesus touched his ear and he healed him? <coughs> After he knew that he was there, you know, how Malchus felt when he knew that he was there to arrest Jesus and to, and to, to begin the trial process. How did Malchus feel when, when Jesus reached out and touched his ear and he was healed? I think something else happened. I think he was healed on the inside. Because, like I said, when you have an encounter with Christ, a true encounter with Christ, you're not the same. You're not the same. Your thoughts aren't the same. Your motives aren't the same. Your direction isn't the same. So there was a change when this encounter took place in this man's life, and it changed him forever. You know, we look at um, Saul on his way to Tarsus. Yeah. And, uh, not Tarsus, um, but anyhow, and uh, so, you know, when Saul was on his, the road to Damascus, I don't know why I said Tarsus, um, but he was on the road to Damascus. You know, Saul was on his way to persecute Christians, to imprison Christians, to, uh, to beat on Christians. But he had an encounter with Christ that blinded him. He had an encounter with God that, that put scales over his eyes and blinded him from the world so he could see the truth when he opened them up. And when he had gotten to the end and they were taking care of him and the scales fell off his face, off his eyes, he was changed. He went from being a persecutor to being an encourager. He went from being someone that was completely against Christianity to being someone that was on fire for God. The same thing happens in our lives. 
same thing should happen in our lives. That when we have an encounter with Christ like this, there should be an evident change. There should be a change that, that is inexplainable to, to some people. And when that change takes place, people notice. You know, I heard um, uh, Henry was talking on Thursday night about, about how when he goes back to school, people are like, man, you've changed. What happened? You've changed. What happened? When there's a change, people notice. Amen. There, people notice. You know, that person that might have struggled with alcoholism, when they got saved, they don't go back to the bars. They don't go back to the clubs or back to their buddy's house. They don't do those things anymore. Why? Because they don't want to fall back into that temptation. They don't want to fall back and go back to that old, to their old self. You know, I heard a story the other day about a gentleman who became saved. He was an alcoholic, and he went back and he was preaching in bars. And it wasn't too long after that, he went right back into it. You have to get away from that environment. You have to get away and pull yourself away and separate yourselves from the things that you once did. That's the change that people are going to notice. That's the change that, that holds merit when people look at you and say, Wow, something's different about you. What happened? And then there's your opportunity to say, well, you know what? This is what happened. Jesus came into my life and he changed it. Mm -hmm. We can tell people we're a Christian until we're blue in the face. But if our life does not reflect our words, we're just blowing smoke. We're just telling people, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't live it. I still do the things that I want to do because they're fun. Because I want to, you know, maybe hold on to that little shred of myself that I can, instead of giving it all over to God, instead of giving it all over to the one who paid the ultimate price, who paid the, the debt that we could never pay, instead of doing all that, they want to hold on to that little shred. They want to hold on to that little piece of them and not give over to God. And that's easy to do. That's easy to do when we don't, when we're not focusing on Christ, when we're not uh, studying the word, when we let the world influence us, we let the, our circumstances influence us. I mean, Peter, I doubt he ever thought that he could walk on water, but he got out of the boat staring at the one that he knew that can, and staring at the one that was walking on the water. And he just got out of the boat not even thinking. And he started walking, but once he focused in on where he was at and what he was doing, that's when it started caving down. That's when he started sinking, and he said, Father, save me. When he realized his circumstances were out of his control, when he realized that the things that were going on around him were not in line with, with you know, what he was looking at, that's when he lost sight of what was truly important. That's when he started to sink, and that's when he had to cry out for help. How long is it going to take before we realize if we just focus on God? We just focus on Christ and what He's done. We just focus on Him. We could be like Peter when He stepped out of that boat and not have to worry. But yet we let life, we let our job, we let our family, our kids, all these other things that are in our life that are important aspects of our life. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that they're not important. But when they take our focus off of Christ, when they take our focus off of what He's done for us, when they take our focus off who He is, that's when we start sinking in that storm. That's when we start sinking in the water. And when we start doing that, when we realize the circumstances around us, that's when we cry out and say, Lord, help me, save me. You know, when somebody gets saved, they're usually at the lowest point in their life sometimes. Because they realize there's nowhere else to go. They've tried everything. They've tried money. Uh, they, they've tried uh, um, you know, alcohol. They've tried drugs. They've tried, you know, company of, of uh, you know, the opposite sex, things like that. I mean, it, the world's searching for something. Just like the men in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were searching. They just didn't realize what mm, they were looking for. That's right. The world's searching. They're, they just don't realize what they're looking for. They don't know what to look for. They're looking for something because there's something inside 
There's a God-sized void in their heart that only God can fill. But yet they try to cram it with, with uh, uh, you know, TV and with uh, internet and with, you know, this, this and that, work and the other things. They try to fill up this empty space with all these empty things that at the end of the day really don't mean anything when we're standing before God. But they try to do it anyway because they think, well, if I just get a little bit more, a little bit more money, then I can buy this and then I'll be happy. Well, they get the money, they buy this, and they're still not happy. Okay, well, then I got to, okay, well, this is good, but, you know, I want to trade it in and get the next thing because that's the newest and latest and greatest, and, and that'll bring me happiness. So they may say for a little bit longer, trade this in, add a little bit more money, get the thing that they want that they said that would make them happy. Yeah, the happiness will last, you know, a month, two, maybe three, but then everything wears off. You know, and, and the perfect example is, you know, look at your cell phone. You know, your cell phones. You know, now they have a plan now where you can upgrade every six months. Because in six months, this newest and latest and greatest thing that you have in your hand is a paperweight. It doesn't mean anything. Because the next newest and latest and greatest thing has come out. But yet people strive and they reach and they reach and they reach and they, they work and they work and they work. To have, to have, to have. So when they die, they pass it on to someone else to take care of it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes. But yet we spin our wheels like a hamster on a wheel. Running in circles, chasing our tail, chasing the, the American dream, and chasing after this and after that of the world. And Jesus is saying, hey guys, hello, I'm the answer right here. Chase after me. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't say that he would give us everything. He didn't say that I'm going to, you know, but he did say I will provide your needs. I will take care of you. I mean, look at the disciples. They left everything. A lot of them were fishermen. A lot of them had, you know, some of them had, had lucrative businesses as, as a tax collector. Making a lot of money. Making a lot of money. But when they said, when Jesus told them, he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They left their nets. They left their profession. They left their money to wander in the wilderness with a man that didn't have a place to lay his head. Pretty impressive that somebody is that willing to leave everything behind. And that's what Jesus is not necessarily calling us to leave everything behind, but he is calling us to let go of the world, to let go of the things that are holding us back. And to come and follow him. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of young people that need a lot of direction. And there's a lot of people, young people that are getting misguided information in our schools, in our society. You know, our society teaches them you step on anybody just to succeed. Our society teaches them that that that's all there is, wealth and fame and, and all this and all that. I mean, you look at all the TV shows, it's always promoting who has the biggest and the baddest. That's what our society is cramming down our young people's throats. But God's saying, come follow me. Store up your treasures in heaven where thieves and moss and rust do not break in and destroy. Store up your treasures in heaven. You know, look at the crowd. They're the crowd that was searching for Jesus is no different than the crowd that's searching for Jesus today. They're looking for an answer. They, they want to see the Messiah. They want to, to fill this void that's in their life. And, and at that time, it was the soldiers were looking to find the Messiah. They were looking to find a person that, that they were going to take out their anger on, that they were going to take out their frustration on, that they were going to take out and show the world that, that we're number one. My question today is, what are you searching for? A lot of us, like I said, they, they try to find comfort and peace in, in uh, gadgets and gizmos and things of this world, in houses and cars and boats and everything else. But just like Judas in the end, it leaves us empty-handed. It leaves us to the point where we realize that <clears throat> the thing that we're forsaken the most was the thing that we should have been seeking the most. We realize that at that point in time that we've wasted a lot of our time. 
we wasted a lot of time and, and effort into searching after things that can be burned and destroyed, crashed, rust, all these things will be taken in an instant. So my question is, what are we searching for today? Are we searching for the things of this world that are going to make us happy? Or are we searching for eternal things? Are we searching for things that are going to mean anything in our life? Or are we searching for things that can be are temporal, that are going to be misplaced or lost, not taken care of by the next person that comes along and gets our things that we work for? Or are we going to be searching for the one who can supply our needs? Are we searching for the one that will open up doors for us and give us meaning and purpose in our life? There's nothing worse than, you know, I, I talked to my oldest brother and, and he, the last time I talked to him, he said that, uh, he said, I just give up. There's nothing for me. The world has that view. There's nothing for them. They think that there's nothing out there. They, they don't realize that there's a God out there that loves them and will give them a purpose if they just surrender their life. And it's sad because growing up he knew that. He understood that. But just like most people, let the world influence him. Let the alcohol influence him. He's filling his time with things that really are not eternal. But at the end of it, he's left empty handed. Everything that he tried to set out and accomplish, he's standing there going like this, there's nothing in my hands. I have nothing. Jesus doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to live a life that's abundantly, a full a purpose, and you're going to be a blessing to others. He wants you to live a life that is, is pleasing to Him. And I know the things that we've done before we were Christians was not pleasing to God. It wasn't pleasing to our bodies, and it wasn't pleasing to God. But yet we still did them anyways. Because in that few moments that we had of pleasure, we calculated and said, well, it was worth it. But in the end, we were left with nothing. In the end, we get to the point where Judas was and realized that, <clears throat> wow, he made a mistake. I gave in, gave up the one who meant the most to me and who I should have been Seeking after, for what? For a little bit of money that I ended up throwing back at the, in the temple. So my question is, what are you searching for today? I want you to guys stand and bow your heads.